now that Kamishwar is here, we can get started. So it's a great pleasure to um, introduce a friend and um, a colleague from the, prof from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Professor Tamer Bashar, who is giving our Dream uh, Citrus People and Robotics seminar this afternoon. Professor Bashar um, is a professor at, as I said, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's been there since 1981. Um, he is the uh, Center for Advanced Study Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and he also holds the Swandlin Endowed Chair in, um, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at UIUC, as well as a number of other professorships within, within the university, uh, the Coordinated Science Lab, the Information Trust Institute. He, um, he held the position of Interim Dean of Engineering um, for 2018, um, and, um, and I just want to say a few words about uh, Professor Bashar's uh, research. I think, um, I, I don't actually really have to say this to many of you, but he has um, over 900 publications in the area of optimal, robust, and adaptive control, large-scale decentralized systems and control, dynamic games, stochastic control, um, and a number of other areas uh, related to systems theory. Um, I think many of you know, if you, if you don't know him, you know of his book, or one of his books, Dynamic Non-Cooperative Game Theory, um, which uh, was first published in 1982, and the latest edition uh, was published by Siam in 1999. Uh, he's written a number of other books, including one um, called Network Security, A Decision in Game Theoretic Approach, uh, a co-author of Game Theory and Wireless Networks and Wireless and Communication Networks, uh, Stochastic Network Control Systems, and he's the co-editor of um, a number of journals um, and books related to uh, systems and control and game theory. I just want to say a few words about uh, about uh, Tamer's awards. I think. Um, He's won every award that it's, it's possible to win. Uh, so I'll name a few. Um, the top awards in, in the IEEE, the IEEE Control Systems Technical Field Award, which he won in 2014. Um, the Isaacs Award of the Inter International Society of Dynamic Games, of which he's the founding uh, director of that society. Uh, the Richard E. Bellman Control Heritage Award of the American Automatic Control Council. The Quatsa Medal of the IFAC. Um, and the Bodhi Lecture Prize of the IEEE Control System Society, which he won in 2004. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and he also won the IEEE Millennium Medal in 2000. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Bashar to Berkeley, um, where he's going to talk today um, about uh, strategic interactions in uh, large-scale networks of agents. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, for this. Uh, so you hear me um, for this generous introduction. It's uh, great to be here. It's uh, uh, extremely pleasing to see uh, a full house here, full plus. And, uh, and the topic I, I picked for today's uh, lecture is uh, involves game theory because I know that there is a lot of interest here at, at Berkeley in, in multiple research groups on game theory. And uh, I'll have uh, an uh, element of risk sensitivity in the, I have uh, inserted that into because I think some of you are also interested in uh, risk sensitivity or risk sensitive based designs in decision making. And then the, the game theory uh, had come to a sort of a, a bottleneck or, or a standstill uh, many years ago because uh, it was very difficult to obtain a, a equilibria, non-cooperative equilibria when you have uh, mixed uh, information structures and, and that's different players have it access to different information. And uh, one way out of that, and, and, and uh, uh, which uh, I was very pleased to see, and, and we had some uh, uh, 
role to play in that is the, is the case when you have a very large number of players. And if you have a large number of players, then certain things simplify. And, uh, and, and so what I want to share with you is uh, essentially that approach, which is called mean field game approach. And, and uh, quite a number of uh, multi-agent uh, network systems uh, problems have a large number of uh, uh, players, a large number of agents. So this is a very relevant theory and, uh, and framework to, to study. So even if you don't have a, a very large, uh, infinite number of players, the mean field game theory applies to infinite number of players. Uh, even with finite number of players, it provides a very good approximation, actually, as I'm, I'm going to discuss. Uh, and the other thing that I want to bring in is robustness into this mean field approach. And I think this is something that, that we introduced. Uh, several years ago, and, uh, and, and the robustness I'm going to uh, bring in through risk sensitivity, and, and we'll see the, the connections between that. Uh, so, so first, let me uh, share with you some of the difficulties that, that we have in uh, general uh, non-zero-sum stochastic differential uh, games. Uh, if we, uh, if players don't have the same uh, access to the same information, so so this is a, a so this is the uh, maybe the only slide or a couple of slides where you'll see nonlinear systems. I'll do it much go into a much simpler framework, but but in the general uh, sort of uh, a and player uh, games or differential games, you have a state equation and, uh, and you have, uh, in this case, n players. Each one has a control input, u1 through un, ui, let's say the i player's control input, and x is the, is the composite state. Uh, of course, it's possible to have partition x into its subcomponents, x1 uh, through xn, where each one is a gain vector value, where each one satisfies a certain uh, differential equation. But the important thing is that the, the, the state equation for the i player uh, is involves some uh, contribution or coupling from the states of other players where the c sub i uh, captures, as well as the controls of the other players. So, so for uh, whenever I have a minus i, it means all other players except the i one, all players except the i one here. So, so you can, uh, this definitely is, a, uh, is something which, which covers problems of this type as well. So uh, now in games, it's, uh, uh, it's very important to know that if any, any formulation is not complete unless you specify exactly what information the players have access to. Now, the, the, the most uh, sort of uh, well-researched information structure is the closed loop perfect state for all players. That is, the, every player has access to this state x, both at the present as well as in the past. So there is an, there is an infinite sort of memory if you go into the uh, infinite future. And, uh, and so, so this is, of course, not very realistic because it's not realistic for the i player to have access to the states of the, uh, all other players. Now, uh, if we have, uh, if we remove that uh, sort of assumption that every player has access to the states of every other player, but have access only to their local states, XIT, then, then you have a problem of this type where, again, this is a policy and you are designing a policy such that the action of the player at time t is a function of only its own state and, uh, uh, and as well as the history. Of course, note that being a function of the, uh, its own state, if you have a state equation of this type, then the state is affected by the decisions of other players, so at least one player and as well as the states of the other players. So, so this is not a problem if it's a minimization problem that this player has access to. You cannot do it independently of what the other player's policies are. 
of course, there's, you can make things more complicated. You can have measurement feedback uh, where the, you have a separate measurement equation for the ith player, uh, which is, the, the, by the way, the B here is the Brownian motion. And, uh, uh, and, and the, uh, the, the player's uh, policy is, is actually one that depends on the, on the measurements. This is the local measurement, but the local measurement of a player I also has input or component from the state of other players. So, so these are, these are uh, not the only information structures. There are other types of information structures like sampled measurements and so on, which, which I'm not uh, listing here. And now you have a loss function for, the, uh, for player I, and, uh, and it's generally a, a function of this type in standard differential game theory, which is a terminal cost as well as an integral cost from uh, T to capital T. This is over the interval T to capital T. Now you take expectations because we have this stochastic quantity and, and then the, you let whatever the information structure is, that is a function of the, the U is going to be a function of that. So that's your gamma, that's the strategy. So you can turn this into a problem where uh, the J, the expected value of this is defined on the policy spaces of the players. That is, depends on gamma I and gamma minus I. And, and, uh, and the Nash equilibrium is very well known. Is uh, you can, this is known as the normal form or strategic form of the game. And you define Nash equilibrium as one where any deviation for any one player at that equilibrium will, uh, not improve uh, that player's performance, okay? So, the, so you minimize this over gamma i and you obtain this. So this is the standard formulation for, for games. And uh, uh, so uh, one, uh, uh, as I indicated, the, the, the uh, one information structure that is, uh, has been researched a lot is, uh, is the one where all players have access to the state. And then in that case, you have a, 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 essentially the problem involves coupled partial differential equations. You are essentially using a dynamic programming type of approach. And one can actually show in that case, assuming that the, uh, the Brownian motion independently uh, influences all uh, channels here, uh, that which amounts to saying that DD transpose is strongly positive, then uh, the Nash equilibrium uh, is, depends only on the current value of the state. So you don't have to use memory and that allows, lets you to uh, write down the partial differential equation which needs to be solved. So, so, so far, so good, the, the, you have the, the trace, the second order sort of partial of V sub I with respect to, to X. And uh, now when you, uh, this is a, a, what we are solving is, a, is essentially a game on this side, a Nash equilibrium solution. So this is not independently of each player and then there is coupling between all these V sub I's. Okay, but at least you can write down the equation. Now the, the, the message here is that if I have some other dynamic information other than open loop information, in which case you use the maximum principle, uh, such as if you have local state or decentralized measurement feedback, these problems are extremely challenging and possibly even if a Nash equilibrium exists, they are, uh, it's possibly infinite dimensional and, and even in linear quadratic games. And, 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 and why? The reason is that's where the strategic interaction comes in. It's because of the strategic interaction of the players. So each player, uh, if I don't know the measurement of the other player or if I don't know the state of the other player, and if that other player's state influences my objective function, then, then I try to guess what the state of that other player has been. So this is called as a second guess phenomenon. But if every player does this, then you have to guess the guess and guess the guess. So that's an infinite recursion. And, uh, and that infinite recursion leads to, if you are doing filtering, for example, for the state, for the unknown part, this leads to an even in linear quadratic problems, an infinite dimensional 
filter. So, uh, so th this is uh, an infinite recursion, and it's essentially not practical to solve uh, such games. And, and there has not been, unless in very specific cases, uh, there hasn't been any, any success story there. So, so let me just, for the sake of completion, in linear quadratic non-zero sum stochastic differential games, if we have perfect state information, and, and uh, then the, uh, those PDEs can be solved uh, in terms of the solutions, can be obtained in terms of the solutions to Riccati equations. So these are the coupled Riccati equations, and, and this is all well known and well, well documented. But when the information is, again, local state or imperfect state measurement, even if it's shared by all players, the existence and characterization is an open problem. And I don't think it's going to be settled unless you have a certain structure. And one of these is the, when you go to the infinite population games, as I'm going to, to discuss. So, so my question, the last bullet, is, is there any hope for n sufficiently large. In other words, for, the, for a finite n, we cannot uh, uh, solve the, the, even the linear quadratic non-zero sum stochastic differential game. But what happens if, if n is very large? Uh, then the, can we solve it? And the answer is the mean field games. So, so there is an insightful statement going back to the origins of, of game theory to von Neumann and Morgenstern uh, regarding these games with a large number of uh, agents. And this is a, a, a quote from uh, pages 13 to 14 of the 1944 edition. Uh, they realized that if you have a large, uh, if you have a, a players, uh, even a small, a small number of players, and if they have different information, even though dynamic information was not, uh, is uh, differential games were not, were not introduced at the time, but still they, they uh, were talking about strategic interactions among players. And, and, and there is this quote which says, that when the number of participants becomes really great, and some, I would use large there, but some hope emerges that the influence of every particular participant will become negligible and that the above difficulties may recede and the more conventional theory becomes possible. And then a few paragraphs down, they say it's well-known phenomenon in many branches of the exact and physical sciences that very great numbers are often easier to handle than those of medium size. And this is, of course, due to the excellent possibility of applying the laws of statistics and probabilities in the first case. For example, if when you are studying thermodynamics, you don't look at the individual atoms, but you look at the, at the, at the collective sort of aggregative impact of those things. So what is the, so the, the question is, how can we come up uh, with a reasonable class of problems uh, within this mean field game framework, uh, which one can actually uh, solve. And uh, so, so the, uh, uh, the framework is, is, the, is the following. Uh, you have the, so I had the uh, state equation of an individual uh, player, the ith player. So this is the, that player's state, and this is that player's uh, control. And then I have another term. Now, earlier I had a C here, which depended on the uh, states of other players as well as on the, on the controls of the other players. Now, in this case, this C is replaced by a single quantity, X and T, where X and T is the average states of other players. This appears, for example, in consensus problems, where the the, the way a player is uh, impacted by what others do is through an average, through an aggregate quantity. And this could be a weighted average also, but I'm going to take it as a, as a simple average. And uh, so, the, so the coupling between the agents uh, is through this averaging term. So the cost function of each agent also uh, does not depend, of the ith agent, does not depend, I don't have a terminal cost here because that doesn't change the story, and uh, does not depend on the individual states of the players, but it depends on uh, this aggregate quantity again, this xn. 
Now, I can bring in an aggregate quantity involving the use as well, but, but I want to keep it simple here. And likewise, here you can also bring in an aggregate quantity. So what, what, what does this buy us? What does bringing in an aggregate quantity like this, and, and I can cite many examples uh, where, uh, of multi-agent systems where uh, the coupling between the players are through an aggregate term like this. So, so the, the approach, uh, when you have this aggregate term, uh, uh, you treat xn, so let's say that each player, uh, and this happens when n is sufficiently large, you treat xn as a fixed stochastic process, and this is called the mean field term. And, and this is the mass behavior of other players. In other words, if you are, if you are driving on a highway and, and you have lots of cars around you, you look at, the, you look at the, the aggregate of those and, and don't look at individual, each individual car because what contributes to the congestion is the aggregate. So, so you treat this as a, as a fixed stochastic process and, and the important thing is that uh, it is not affected by agent I's choice of control even though you may have, of course I don't have to include this x and t, uh, I have included x i t here, but since n is sufficiently large, the x sub i t does not make uh, much change, changing x i t does not change x n by much, especially if n is large. Okay, so, so otherwise, otherwise I would, if I had a finite uh, player game, then I would have to take the dependence of xn on xit, and that makes things much more complicated. So, so we, take the, we take this as a fixed stochastic process, not affected by uh, i-th agent's control. And then so each agent now faces a stochastic control problem, and, uh, and for each fixed fn, and the fn is, is this uh, uh, mass behavior, the xnt, and this, is, uh, this could be a stochastic process, it could be a deterministic process as well as n goes to infinity. And uh, so you solve this and the, the state equation in this case because of this term becomes a, what's called a McKim-Vlasov equation. And then, the, and then you generate, you solve the i agent's problem. It could depend on g sub, g sub i, uh, it's, in fact, in uh, many papers in the, in the literature, this G sub i is just a, a G. And that is, uh, players are indistinguishable, but you can make this as a function of i. And, uh, and uh, uh, so you, you solve this stochastic control problem that's faced by agent i. And then you, whatever the outcome is of the stochastic pro uh, control problem, you generate the state process under these optimal controls for each agent. And, and that leads to a focal plan Kolmogorov forward equation. And then what you want is, I mean, you, you had taken, you had made an assumption in this, in this solution on, this, on the uh, uh, form of xn or the, the, what sort of a stochastic process it was at a certain distribution. But you, we have to make sure that the, as a result of this, what we obtain, uh, when we obtain this x and t after we substitute in uh, the optimum trajectories, which will be functions of this fn, then the, uh, uh, I have to solve for x n from t, uh, from that equation, and as n goes to infinity, and that entails solving a fixed point equation. So that solves, th so this is called a mean field uh, uh, equilibrium, uh, uh, that is a mean field equilibrium consists of the u sub i's which solve this and, and note that each u sub i in this case is going to be a function of x i t because of the stochastic assuming that this is a, a positive uh, d i d i transpose is positive definite. So this is going to be a function of x i t, x i only, so only a function of the local information. And, uh, and everything else, what the other players do are in this term, but this term is independent of the, of the uh, strategies of the other players. If a, if a single player deviates from its optimum solution, xn is not going to change much as n goes to infinity. Of course, this has to be theoretically shown that this is indeed the case. 
So, so this is known as a mean field equilibrium. The mean field equilibrium is the individual UIs which solve this stochastic control problem and the corresponding XNT, which is the corresponding FN here. So, so it's a pair. It's, it's an N tuple or, or for the UIs as well as the XN. But the important thing is here that uh, if I had to solve a finite game problem, then each UI would have to be a function of the other player's states as well. In order, as I, as I uh, indicated earlier on the previous slides. But, but, but if I want to solve a, a game where I force U sub I to be a function of only Xi, then that involves an infinite recursion. But this mean field approach gives us automatically a solution which is a function of Xi only, okay? So, so then the next thing, and the final sort of uh, chapter of this, of this stage of this analysis, is that uh, you say, well, I'm not, I don't have a problem with an infinite number of players. I have only a finite number of players, but a, but a high population, like the number of cars on the, on the, uh, on the highway, or the number of uh, individuals using uh, the internet. So, so you have a finite number, and the question is, so here we have a solution for the infinite population. Can I use that solution for the finite population game? And to what extent I obtain an approximate solution? So, so one has to study the relationship between the finite n uh, and infinite n solutions, and that leads to an epsilon Nash equilibrium. And there's a lot of work which relates epsilon to n, and generally it is like 1 over n, in the order of 1 over n, sometimes in the order of 1 over square root of n. So, so the, the, all the simulations and so on we have uh, uh, done show that, the, of course, theoretically, you can show an order relationship. But, but it shows that even, even with a reasonable sort of a 10 to 15 players, the infinite player solution gives a, a very sort of an uh, acceptable uh, uh, approximate Nash equilibrium for the, for the problem. And this was the mean field games. This was initiated by uh, two camps, the Lazarion Lyons from the approach it from the uh, PDE point of view, and uh, a paper which appeared in the Japan Journal of Math in 2007. Uh, almost uh, concurrently, the, the Keynes and his group, Juan Keynes and Malhame, uh, they published a paper in the Transactions of Automatic Control where they dealt with the linear quadratic problem only. So, so that's the, the mean field. I'll come back to that, but, but let me, let me uh, discuss a little bit the risk sensitivity because I'm going to make a connection between these. So, so very brief, uh, quick introduction to risk sensitivity. Uh, you have a, a loss function. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to bring in the robustness angle to, to computation of mean field. And, 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 and we were, as I indicated earlier, the, the first one to uh, bring that in, into that framework. So, uh, so we have a loss function. So this is a static problem, not a dynamic problem. A loss function which depends on the action of a player and, then, and, and also some probabilistic variable c. And uh, you make a measurement, uh, y, and the y is a measurement on, on c, a noisy measurement. And then you, uh, your decision rule is mu, so the, your action is your decision rule applied on y. So the, the standard thing is to use a risk-neutral cost where you essentially, you take the loss function, you take, you take the expected value of this, the stochastic quantity is c, you take the expected value of c given y, and, uh, and, then, and then you minimize this over mu, or you can minimize it over u as well because you are conditioning it here, assuming all the measurability assumptions and so on. This is what you saw. Now, the risk sensitive cost is one where uh, you don't, uh, this is risk neutral because you are taking the average of L. Here, you exponentiate L, and after you multiply it with a parameter theta, and, uh, and, and then you take the, the, this is a monotonic transformation. This is not very important, ln, and then you divide it by th theta. 
So, and then you want to minimize this overall decision rules mu at the same time. Now, the theta is, is what's known as the risk sensitivity parameter. Now, if I, if I expand this around theta equal to zero, what I obtain, the leading term here, if theta is very, very small, then the risk neutral uh, uh, cost is a, is a very good approximation. But if theta is not very small, uh, then, then the, the next leading term is theta over two times variance of L. So if you don't care about the higher order terms theta squared, then, then essentially what you would be doing is you are minimizing uh, the sum of the average as well as a weighted variance. Now, now there are other sorts of approaches to these. You can, you can minimize the, the risk neutral cost subject to a constraint on the variance, or you can, you can minimize the variance subject to a constraint on this, and so on. And, and there are all these other variations in operations research and so on. But uh, from my point of view, this is including all these terms gives you a much cleaner solution. And, uh, and then you can adjust, adjust theta because you can obtain solutions more explicitly and bring in a robustness interpretation to this. So again, theta equal to zero, you, you have just the average cost. If theta is less than zero, that's a risk seeking, optimistic. You, you play in the stock market, you assume that, that everything is the, 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 all the rare events will line up to your advantage. And, and, and so therefore, you are going to benefit by being optimistic. So, so, the, so the theta being negative means that the variance is going to help you. And uh, uh, if theta is positive, this is the, the, the pessimistic one, risk averse one, and this is what's related to robustness. Then, the, uh, then you are not minimizing only this, but you are minimizing uh, to, to one uh, degree of approximation, minimizing the sum of these two. But as I indicated, there is value in including all these terms and then minimizing this thing. So, so note that uh, you, cannot, you cannot be overly pessimistic. Because if you are overly pessimistic, then you may as well not make any decision at all. And, uh, and uh, for example, if the, if the C and Y are jointly Gaussian distributed, then the theta times uh, expected value of, of J of theta, in other words, I get rid of this. It's, it's just uh, to have a simpler expression here, is an integral of this times uh, the Gaussian pulls it down. Theta is positive and L is positive, so this pulls it up. So this places a, a bound on theta. So this means that the theta times L has to be less than 1 over 2 sigma squared C squared as C goes to infinity. Okay? If this is quadratic in C, then you can see that theta times 2 sigma squared has to be less than 1. So, so theta cannot be too large. In other words, you cannot be too pessimistic. Otherwise, you lose the robustness margins and, and you lose the... Uh, the, the unfavorable paths will drive you to a disastrous outcome. So, so again, what is the, uh, for, especially for theta positive, what is the interpretation of, of working with a loss function of this type? Essentially, what exponentiation does, and then you are taking the expectation, this is monotonic, as I said, it, it puts much heavier weight on uh, paths of the stochastic quantity uh, which, are, uh, which are least favorable to the decision maker. Okay, so, so, so you are protecting yourself against the worst possibility in some sense, but you cannot be too pessimistic in doing that because otherwise there is no decision problem to solve. So, uh, so in, uh, we can, now the question is how does this apply to a sense of, uh, to uh, non-zero sum stochastic differential games. Now you, you replace, I have the J sub I, uh, I replace it with this one. So I have the L I and then I exponentiate the theta over two, divided by, and then multiply it by two over theta after I take the L N. 
So note that if this were a deterministic problem, now why do I have these terms? Is because the, if this were deterministic, then the, of course ln is the inverse of exponential. Two over theta cancels this, so you essentially have L sub i. So this plays a role only for stochastic problems because we are uh, uh, securing our, cell, our losses against worst possible outcomes on the stochastic trajectory. So, um, so then this is the, so Nash equilibrium we can define as before and the same difficulties with regard to information structures and strategic interactions arise as, as before. So now what happens if I have a risk sensitive stochastic control problem before we solve the Nash equilibrium we have to look at the stochastic control problem. So, so here is a state equation and then, and then this is I put an epsilon here because if epsilon equal to zero this is a deterministic problem we'll see what happens in the limit and the B is a standard Wiener process of Brownian motion and, uh, and we are using state feedback control. And, uh, and we want to pick mu in order to minimize this cost function and uh, where L is given by this. Okay, standard. I'll go very quickly, the, the end result is important. We can introduce a value function. This is a well-defined problem if I have the right conditions on F and so on, very reasonable conditions. And then the, and then the value function here, V is the infimum of J, which is two epsilon over theta Ln. But the, but the important thing here is uh, we use the dynamic programming uh, approach and the Ito differentiation rule. And, and what we end up with is a, is a cost function, uh, is an equation of this type. Okay, so, so uh, I have two terms here. This is one that you normally obtain if you have a risk neutral cost function. But this is something which has uh, uh, crept in uh, because of the exponential cost. Note that this is the, this is the uh, uh, gradient of V with respect to X multiplied by D, quadratic term. I didn't have any quadratic term here. And there is one over four gamma squared and, the, and one over gamma squared is theta. So, so if theta is very large, then this term dominates. So uh, if I, uh, just to see this, uh, if, if U is, uh, if F is linear in U and G is quadratic in U, then the optimal control is given in this form. The corresponding Hamilton-Jacobi equation is this. And uh, a further special case, actually this was, goes back to Jacobson in, in 2073. Uh, you can obtain an explicit solution. And those of you who are in H infinity optimal control will, will notice, will realize this term that, that uh, it's uh, because of this term, uh, this Riccati equation may not have a solution, may have finite escape actually if this term is, is very large, if D is post uh, this. And again, uh, this term being large, one over gamma squared means that theta is large, the sensitivity parameter. So now, com coming to, to zero sum games, and I'll make the connection. Let's say that we have two players, player one and player two. So, so this is the original equation, uh, state equation I had, I brought in an additional perturbation term which is controlled by an adversary, by another player. The j, this is the same j, but now I brought in another term minus gamma squared, like in H infinity optimal control and an integral of Ws. So there is some cost on the adversaries or the, on the, or the cost or the, or the perturbation terms uh, cost. So this is now, uh, I formulate this as a game between U and W. And uh, so W is a fictitious, fictitious input into the system which is controlled by an adversary. And uh, you write down the upper value function for this game, the inf soup, and then the hamilton jacobi isaacs uh, upper value equation. And uh, so I'll, I'll go quickly over this. And what you end up with, this W, is identical with the V I had earlier for the risk sensitive stochastic control problem for all permissible epsilon and gamma. And, and you can, one can show that the same holds for the time average case. So what that uh, does is there is a complete equivalence, even for nonlinear problems, between risk sensitive 
optimal control, stochastic for optimal control, and risk neutral without exponentiation, game problem, zero sum game, where the, the fictitious adversary, fictitious player, uh, has the same information as the, the controller. Okay, so, so this is the robustness interpretation of, uh, of, the, of the problem. Okay, so, so now the, the, uh, uh, what I would like to uh, discuss is the coming back to mean field problems uh, with exponential costs. Now, with mean field problems, uh, games with exponential costs, I can have the risk sensitive approach, one. I can also have this robustness approach, which means risk neutral costs, but, uh, but bringing in a fictitious play, fictitious player. And the question is, does this equivalence hold in the mean field game as well? And uh, so I call this uh, problem P1 and P2. And this is for details. I mean, we'll not go into the technical details, but we have a paper with uh, one of my former uh, uh, PhD students, Jun Moon, who is now in Korea, which appeared in the Transactions for Automatic Control in 2017. And we had an earlier paper, but which didn't look into this uh, 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 relationship, by, uh, which introduced the robust sort of a, or exponential risk sensitive mean field games, which appeared in 2014 with Tembin and So, So here, very uh, quickly, so. Uh, you have a stochastic differential equation, and for each player, note that the A matrix, this is a linear, now I'm discussing linear quadratic. There is some extension of this to nonlinear systems, but this is uh, easier to explain. <coughs> the A and B matrices are functions of these theta i's, where these are the types of the players. So each player is uh, associated with a theta sub i, and one can assume that theta sub i's are independent, for example, when the a's are, but, but the a's, some of the a's could be the same as well. And then, and then you have a, a, a Brownian motion. There is sensitive cost functions uh, for the uh, player, for the i's player, is again the log exponential of this. Now, I, I have a special, this is like a consensus problem, where the objective of a player, i, is to make, to track the average of the states of all the other players, including itself. So, so you want to minimize the, the L2 norm of weighted by some Q of xit for each player, xit and the, and the average of xj. And then there is some cost on control as well. So, uh, uh, so we are looking for a risk sensitive uh, control. And again, uh, here I have changed the notation that I have uh, delta instead of theta. And uh, so, so you have, uh, again, if we uh, expand it with respect to delta, uh, then you obtain uh, the, uh, when delta is large or 1 over delta is small, then you have this expansion. So, so you, this is the mean field term. This is the mass behavior. And note that the agents in this case are coupled with each other through the mean field term, through the cost function. In this case, in this relatively simpler model, we don't have any interaction between the agents through the state equation, because this is a tracking problem. And uh, so uh, the, the second problem is, is one uh, which is the robustness, uh, will bring in the robustness interpretation. There is an additional term here which is VI, which is the, uh, which is the player, uh, fictitious player. And note that each, each uh, uh, state has a separate player, which is going against, playing against that one. So uh, the worst case with neutral cost, so in this case, we are go looking for the worst case. So, so we are going to supremize over VI of the limb soup of this quantity. Okay, so this is an average, average cost. And, uh, and again, again, we want to do uh, tracking, and uh, we want to make XIT track the average, and uh, with some cost on the control, but also 
recognizing that there is a, 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 an adversary who is trying to make life difficult in this tracking problem. So that is it. And the agents are again coupled with each other through the mean field term. So, so here is the, I already discussed how to obtain the mean field solution. So, so you treat uh, this average as some exogenous process like G of T. And then the, uh, you, you play against that mass behavior, i player. And then, and then you come back and, and show that there is a, a fixed point of this equation. Okay? And uh, so, so your solution, uh, the control is going to be a function of G. And, uh, but you don't know what G is. And G depends on the, on the state's average state uh, of all the other players. And then you have to make sure that you have consistency throughout. And, uh, and we can show for this problem that there exists a unique fixed point under some conditions uh, uh, using some contraction. Okay? So, so this is the, uh, uh, for both problems, the robust tracking control uh, is of the following form. This is an infinite horizon problem. So you have a Riccati equation and note that there is this is like the Riccati equation that arises in H infinity optimal control with this term. Gamma uh, cannot be too small, or 1 over gamma squared cannot be too large. And, uh, uh, and then, the, so it consists of two terms. This is the feedback term, and this is the term that depends on the mean field. That is, the SDT is, uh, uh, is involves a, a G here. Okay, So it's driven by G. And then the, you can, for the second problem, P2, you have a worst case disturbance, with, which is an additional thing, and which, of course, doesn't appear in the, in the other problem. And S, one can show, has a unique solution in the space of continuous bounded uh, functions on this infinite interval with, uh, uh, of dimension n. OK? So, so what one can, so the, so the, the answer so the first question I ask is, are these two uh, in the mean field? We, we had seen that the risk sensitive control and the worst case design, they are equivalent. And, uh, and uh, do we have equivalence in the mean field uh, case as well? And what we can show is that the two robust tracking problems are actually identical. They have exactly the same control. But in this, the, the, the equivalence is only up to this point because the G's uh, are going to be different. The mean fields themselves are going to be different. And uh, uh, so, uh, so mean field, I'm the, it turns out that uh, this pro in this problem, the mean field term, you don't have to look at the, all the moments of the distribution, but only to the, to the mean value. That's the expectation by the law of large numbers. And, uh, and, and then you can uh, actually look at, uh, uh, do a fixed point analysis and show that this tau is actually a fixed point. Okay, I'm going to skip this because of um, for time and strong law of large numbers. So, so we need to seek a G star and A star such that G star is T of G star and A star is L of H star. And uh, we can obtain a sufficient condition due to contraction mapping, which leads to a unique solution. Details are not important. And so therefore, this allows us, because of the contraction mapping theorem, Barnard's contraction mapping, we have an infinite recursion, which leads to the G star, regardless of where you start, G zero. And, uh, and the players can actually use that. Uh, and, uh, and G star and A star are the best estimates of this F and T when N is large. And we can show that we can have the order relationships as to how close they are to F and T. But generally, G star is not equal to A star unless gamma goes to infinity, which is the risk neutral problem. Okay? Gamma going to infinity means theta going to zero. And then G star is equal to A star. So now the, the, the last chapter, as I said, is to show that this, this infinite uh, population solution, the mean field equilibrium, provides a reasonable uh, approximation if you apply it to the finite population game. 
And uh, so what do we have to uh, prove? And note that this is, uses only local information. You are using each control is a function of the local state in this case. And, and, the, and the tracking part, the states of the other players come in through the mean field term, which is independent of the strategies of the other players. So, so essentially what we are looking for is, is whether I can find that for a finite uh, player game, whether I can find an epsilon n so that when I use this ui star uh, for the thing, uh, for player i uh, and, and u minus i star for the other players, the player can only improve its cost by an amount epsilon n at most. And, the, and then the question is, what is the relationship with, between epsilon n and zero? So what we can show that it's in the order of one over square root of n, okay? So, so the important thing is that this epsilon nest strategy is decentralized. I don't know of any other way of showing that when you have uh, use only local information, uh, a solution that you obtain using local information is an approximate Nash equilibrium for the original problem, okay? And, uh, and using law of large numbers, we, we can show that uh, G star is, uh, uh, is satisfies this, this property. And G star, as I indicated, is a deterministic problem. And the same also holds for P2, the worst case distribution. So, so here, this uh, schematic, uh, 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 summarizes the solution. We have a partial equivalence in the limiting behaviors. As I indicated, the controls are the same, but the mean fields themselves are not. The structure of the controls are the same. And uh, so you have a linear quadratic risk sensitive mean field game, which is P1, a linear quadratic uh, robust mean field game, this is P2. There was a partial equivalence between these. As you let gamma go to infinity, which means the sensitivity parameter go to zero, then that's a risk neutral problem, then of course the two are the same. Okay, that's the, so I'm not, uh, so I think I'm running, so we have done several simulations and so on. For example, we are able to compute for this problem, which is a scalar. Each, each player has a scalar uh, a state equation and, uh, and uh, a, B, a is the only one that distinguishes different players. A, I is theta I, which is I, I, D, uniform random variable over this interval. We find out that uh, the, uh, the mean field term uh, in the risk sensitive case is this. And whereas it's deterministic because it's the expected value of uh, 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 the average of the x's. And the mean field term in the other case is this. So they're quite different, okay? And then one can show a good performance of these. This is for 500, I think we had, we picked up 500 agents and then uh, and they are coalescing very nicely. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Okay, so now the conclusions and uh, so I have discussed decentralized local state feedback, epsilon Nash equilibria for linear quadratic with sensitive and linear quadratic robust mean field games. The equilibrium features robustness due to local robust optimal control problem, which is parameterized by gamma. Again, emphasizing that uh, the two are only partially equivalent, where G star is not the mean fields themselves are not the same but they hold the same limiting behaviors as the one agent case. So one can extend this to the heterogeneous case and nonlinear dynamics, possible, but the results are not as explicit. Uh, now you may say, what happens if we have incomplete information? That is the measurements. Uh, I, I don't have perfect access to X, but to measurements. We have looked at that uh, in the discrete time uh, case, and, uh, and uh, we have obtained the discrete time counterparts for general Markov decision problems with discounted costs. So there are two papers, if anyone is interested, I can send you. One is on the, uh, in CCON in 18, the other one is the math operations research uh, with Saldi, who was a postdoc uh, 
with me and, and Max Wierginski, a colleague of mine at Illinois. And um, for the imperfect state measurements, that's uh, a challenge, uh, but one can show that you can uh, lift the problem to a higher dimensional space, just like in the, you, you can bring in sufficient statistics and obtain the solution in terms of the probability, conditional probability of the state given the measurements. We have, again, uh, some recent work which appeared in the math operations research. Uh, it's a general case for discounted uh, problem. We sense the mean field games on networks where the agents interact only with their neighbors. That is doable. And, uh, and, and in fact, this, this uh, general framework applies, applies to that as well. But assuming that you have a connected network. And, and one thing I didn't, I didn't put here is that, which is, which is now the, uh, a hot topic, is what you hear, the assumption was that Agents have access to their own dynamics as well as they know the dynamics of other players. What happens if you don't do if you don't have that? Then we have some recent work which is applying uh, uh, reinforcement learning to problems of this type, where you bring in learning uh, alongside alongside uh, uh, strategy construction. And, uh, and finally, uh, in some problems, we have uh, a, the players are not of equal here, the, the, at least in this presentation, I assume that the players are generally indistinguishable. That is, they have the same l power in, in affecting the state dynamics and the cost functions. But what happens if one player is much more powerful than the rest of the, the, the group? Then this leads to uh, what's called major minor player, mean field games, uh, which, which can be, there are two different solution concepts one can introduce for that. One is the Nash equilibrium, where the major player is, uh, has uh, substantial influence on the outcome. And the other one is the leader follower mean field games where the leader is the Stackelberg leader. And this is a paper that we published in Automatica in November 2018. So I'm sorry I went over, but uh, thank you very much. Yes. I, I didn't define epsilon Nash equilibrium for the mean field game when n is infinite. I defined it for a finite uh, player game when we have n players. And the, and the question I asked was, here you have the solution to the mean field game where you assume that, that you have an infinite number of players or a continuum of players. If I use that solution in a finite game scenario, a finite player scenario, how close am I to the Nash equilibrium of that finite game problem, even though I know that I cannot solve that, that game? And so we can show that it is with an epsilon, where epsilon depends on n as 1 over square root of n. And, uh, the, it is, uh, uh, so it's well defined, yes. I mean, there are other ways of, sometimes mean field games do not have Nash equilibria, but have epsilon Nash equilibria, then there won't be an N there, just an epsilon. Other questions? Let's all thank Professor Bashar for his talk. Thank you.